Folks, welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Come to you on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, and what a treat. It's been a few years since I reached out to this cat. Um, most people know him in modern times from Late Night with Conan O'Brien and uh, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, but uh, my guest was deeply rooted. His rudiments were within swing and bebop and post-bop. He was a jazz fanatic, and uh, growing up in North Jersey, he had uh, quite an opportunity to be able to uh, uh, not only um, – uh, see the legends, but uh, but also maybe even uh, play with them. And uh, what an honor on uh, John Coltrane's birthday and I believe Bruce Springsteen's birthday today, Max Weinberg. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, Jake, thanks a lot. It's good to be with you and all your listeners. Is it Bruce's birthday too? It is. So, I mean, Coltrane. and 23rd and John Coltrane. So let's just break it down. Tell me about the first time that you saw Train play live and the visceral, especially during that, I mean, you were born in 51. Did you see Coltrane play live? No, I didn't, but I had the pleasure of uh, seeing Elvin Jones uh, quite a bit and uh, got to know Elvin Jones a little bit. And while my style and the music that attracted me wasn't per se in that uh, genre, growing up a rock drummer, uh, Pretty much, you know, when you saw Elvin Jones play up close, I can remember, remember seeing him in New York at a drum clinic one time where he was literally in a 20 by 20 foot studio with about eight other young drummers. And uh, that was pretty amazing. So that was the closest I got to uh, experiencing the power and the drive of John Coltrane's music. Uh, but of course, you know, how could you be a musician and not know a love supreme and the great things that he did and, you know, the spiritual guy that he was? I, I guess, but yeah, I, no, my, I want to go influences were, No, going back to yeah, Elvin, go going back to Elvin, I just, I wanted to read you a, a quote from um, the late, great uh, Butch Trucks. Um, he said that um, when I did my interview with him, he said, when Elvin's playing and John Coltrane's playing along on A Love Supreme, Elvin's playing really light, and he's playing patterns that do nothing but accentuate what John Coltrane is playing. He said, when JMO and I practiced together, we not, never got in each other's way. It was never planned, never practiced. It was just the way we played. And then he, he riffs on, they actually created the, their own bass drum. But, you know, could you talk specifically about the vocabulary that Elvin was adding to rhythm at that time well he was a groundbreaking drummer in that he was an equal partner in the musical conversation uh that they were having it with whomever he played with and his use of triplets and rolls i don't want to get too deep in the weeds of, uh, no no that's drumming, that's what the show's about this uh, you can go as deep as you want well it was very uh very very unique you know he brought a uh, uh an incredible power and dynamism to his drumming um so when he was playing it was almost like he was soloing and you know you may or may and your fans may or may not know that he was a huge influence on mitch mitchell uh jimmy hendrix and the experience mm -hmm. uh, drummer absolutely it was prime, his prime influence <laughs> and uh you know you you uh you know, he's, he, he was an incredible showman without trying to be a showman as well. Because those guys grew up in the era of Cab Calloway and Chick Webb and uh, the great entertainers who, uh, uh, you know, really put on a show. So they appreciated putting it across, even if it was in a uh, strictly, you know, musical, instrumental performance genre. Um, when I, Ayerto, when I interviewed Ayerto maybe five years ago, he, he talked about, uh, when you would see Elvin, you know, he kind of would look, I mean, I was born in 78 and Elvin obviously was still on the scene, but it was well past jazz's most, you know, 
uh, popular realm in this country. But Ayrto just said, he goes, you know, Elvin would have this, you know, he was sort of intimidating. Like, it would be hard to go up to him, per se, and be like, you know, you'd want, you'd want to go engage him. But then when you did, he just had these really white teeth. Ayrto kept talking about these very white teeth and just a friendly, fatherly figure. And I, I'd like you to talk about, um, you know, even in your limited time, how he was a mentor to you and how he, you, got, you guys became friends. Well, I can't say he was a mentor, and he certainly wasn't a friend. Uh, he was someone I admired, and having been in his company a handful of times, he was always very outgoing. And uh, uh, it sort of reflected his drumming, you know. He was a very charismatic character. Uh, there was a great movie, well, it wasn't a great movie, but he was great in it, called Zachariah. I've seen it. Oh, yeah, that's a great movie. He's seen it, yeah. <laughs> and he played the gunslinger in it. And, you know, for people who knew you know, him strictly as an instrumentalist, it was, uh, uh, it was a stretch, but it wasn't, because it, he had that in his personality, that gunslinging attitude, which I think all drummers do. I mean, you know, far and away, uh, the best, in my view, jazz drummer was, of course, Buddy Rich who encompassed everything, and not just his showmanship and his style, but his combinations of rhythmic things that he did. Uh, he encompassed the history of jazz music, and um, you got to know him very well in the last 10 or 15 years of his life. Uh, and he was the sweetest guy in the world, despite what people think of uh, him. He was really... Uh, and, you know, not that everybody, they've heard the tapes and all that other uh, nonsense. He was always very, really nice to me. And uh, so if you're looking at jazz drummers in me, he was the biggest influence. I'm certainly no Buddy Rich, but he was the biggest <laughs> influence in terms of his ability to put it across, to drive the band. You know, in my own rock playing, that's what I've always attempted to do. Uh, in those days, when I was growing up on TV, you did have the opportunity of seeing lots of musicians on a regular basis. There were a lot of variety shows. So you would see uh, Count Basie with his variety of drummers, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, all incredible drummers and incredible uh, showmen. One guy named Speedy, who was, uh, I think his last drummer he had with his big band, just in, you know, before Butch uh, uh, Miles, a uh, fantastic, fantastic drummer. His name was Speedy? Um, Speedy, yeah, it was his nickname. Uh, so, yeah, the, 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 in those days, it was a real advantage to be able to see great players playing all the time. See Duke Ellington with, you know, a uh, sunny uh, career. Uh, incredible. Uh, the, play, you know? Well, and also, I'm, I'm producing a film documentary on Stan Getz, and Buddy Rich, even though Stan was, I mean, he could drink 10 scotches neat, and he could get up on the bandstand and play perfectly, but he was a drug, uh, Buddy Rich never did a drug in his life and used to come up to Ir to Irvington and, and help Stan out when he was having problems, because Kathy Rich would get in the car with him. Buddy was a mensch, I mean, there's no doubt about it, and... Uh, Max, you know, we, we do like to get in the weeds on this program, uh, and I want to play this, this excerpt. You're really, you're really a genocidic, aren't you? Well, I just think, you know, listen, you, this is way beyond a radio program, and, and we'll get into that later, but uh, it's all music. I come from the Duke Ellington School, and I want to play you a clip uh, from one of my guests earlier this year, uh, and I really want you to focus on the content of it in court, and then think about how you, you, use, you use your foot and also the modern day drummer using their foot. So let's take a listen and we'll come back. Well, the foot is not used anymore like it used to be. What we'll say four on the floor means that you play four, four time with the, with the bass drum. Uh, and nowadays because of Tony Williams and Elvin Jones and those drummers, Roy Haynes, those drummers influenced other drummers to lead the foot out. Max Roach, he left it out too, but Kenny Clark was one of the original drummers that used to have the foot sound. And Art Blakey had it too. And you could hear the difference. Billy Joe had it as well. You could hear the difference. And then when they played a company, when they played ensemble stuff, the foot would always be gone because the bass player has to have that 
he's standing right next to you, so if he can't hear your foot doing four beats to the measure the same as he's doing, then you can't lock in on a rhythm to make a nice cushion for the soloist or the or the composition or whatever it is you're playing. But you have to have, and the bass players don't want you to play it too loud because it makes the bass sound, the notes sound real short, you know. So you have to be able to feather it, they call it, feather the bass drum. All the old-time drummers used to do it. One 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 person who did it but very loud was Buddy Rich. He was loud, but he would do it through everything. Right. And uh, Louis Belson used to do it too, but not, not as loud as Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich sounded like a truck. Buddy Rich sounded like a truck. Do you have any idea who that is? I don't. That's uh, Albert uh, Tootie Heath, the great drummer from Philadelphia. Um, and I wanted you to talk about uh, how you, how do you, how did you learn to feather the bass drum? Because what we're ha- what we're going on now in modern music is that we have double bass drums that are often pulsating. And they can all sound like machine gun fire. The old school drummers, they had this way of feathering the bass drum. And I'd like Max Weinberg to talk about how you learned to feather the bass drum. Well, as a drummer, you're a freelancer generally. So you have to be adept at various styles of music. And I, I in no way consider myself a jazz drummer. And I would put myself in that uh, exalted company. And my love is rock and roll, and the way I grew up was playing rock and roll. As I got older, I certainly learned to appreciate the finer subtleties of instrumentalists who had taken the drums to such an incredible level. I had the great pleasure of studying for three years with Joe Morello, who you know, was one of the first drummers to really introduce polyrhythms into, uh, into jazz very influential. I never quite got the credit he should have gotten for the influence he had on the uh, all the members of the day through that quartet. That's right. But that was a delightful guy and just an, an amazing, amazing drummer. Um, always, even as he uh, aged. Um, the idea of playing the dynamics, as you correctly point out, is something that in pop records is uh, certainly uh, a bit of a lost art. Uh, and that has to go to uh, recording techniques and just what people are playing, the different ways people are playing. You know, uh, Charlie Watts' uh, favorite drummer is a guy named Dave Tuff, who I'm sure you know, uh, who everyone talks about Davey Tuff for the sound of his drums. He wasn't a great rudimental executor, but to hear Buddy Rich talk about with a group of drummers, myself and Steve Gadd included, uh, to talk about Davy Tuff and Chick Webb, yeah. who threw out the subtleties of the drums and had such a beautiful sound of their drums. So the idea of feathering the bass drum, you're talking about the transition from swing to early modern jazz. And Kenny Clark, Max Roach, uh, Roy Haynes, were among the earliest, you know, way before Elvin Jones. It was like Papa Joe Jones, too? And no. No, he was not a bop drummer. He, they, they were swing drummers. Uh, that era, mm. uh, Joe Jones, um, uh, Sonny Greer, all the 30s drummers were definitely on the floor with occasional bombs. But, you know, these were big, big bands, and uh, you, you, you didn't want to get in the way. Uh, so you'd play a light four, and then occasionally you'd hit an accent. Uh, Max Roach was particularly influential in dropping out the bass drum and keeping time with the cymbal. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly as, right. Man. Only using the bass drum as accents. Uh, drummers call them, and other musicians said, dropping bombs. You know, you wouldn't hear anything, and then you'd hear a boom, and... So the emphasis went from the bottom, which was the press roll drummers of the 20s, like Baby Dodds and Ziddy Singleton, where they were basically marching band drummers, and to the 30s, where the big bands wanted to feel that four, as you said, four on the floor pulse, 
but because they were tuned calf skin heads, you had to be very careful about how loud you were playing that, where it sounded just like a thud, and it would interfere with the harmonics of the bass. So you had to play kind of light and keep that pulse going. In the 30s, and in the early 40s, there's this fantastic picture of Roy Hans playing at Mittens when he was 18 years old, and the front line is Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, and Charlie Parker. <laughs> and he was, he was in high school, and you know he's still well into his 90s, playing unbelievably well, and he looks 50 years old. He was one of the first guys who picked up on that. And Kenny Clark moved from America to uh, France and lived there as an expatriate. And Kluke, as they called him, was extremely influential to the transition between the big band swing drummers and the small group, you know, quintets, septets, quartets, even trios. And uh, he was a very you know, a missing link between those guys. And uh, so it was always fascinating, uh, for me anyway, to hear a guy like Buddy Rich or Joe Morello uh, uh, talk about the people that they admired. Um, Buddy Rich is one of his favorite drummers. I don't know if a lot of people know this, was a guy named Billy Gladstone, who was the drummer percussionist for the New York Philharmonic. Buddy Rich said he used to go to uh, see him play for two dollars, which is a lot of money when he went to see him play. Right. And he said he had the greatest double stroke roll he ever heard. He said it was like ripping a piece of sandpaper in half. <laughs> it was so clean. So I've always appreciated hearing the drummers that I admire uh, talk about the drummers they admire. The way Buddy Rich talked about the great. Uh, Chick Webb, who was not only a band leader, but an amazing drummer, and discovered Ella Fitzgerald in the early 30s, uh, he was rhapsodic about going up to Harlem and seeing that band cut everybody. I mean, there wasn't any, any other band that was better than Chick Webb's band. And uh, so the sort of history, uh, it all diverged a bit after World War II when you know, the, uh, uh, all the records that were being made from the late 40s and early 50s, all the pop records and what became jump blues and then rock and roll, all of the drummers on that were, were considered themselves jazz drummers. There was, no, uh, there was no concept of being a rock and roll drummer. These were all jazz drummers making what became rock records or pop records. And uh, there's so many unsung greats well, no. I, by the way, Max, I also, if you, the way you're kind of like, keep yourself close to the microphone because you're fading in and out and you're, what you're saying is so important. So I want to make sure you're, you're right up close there because you, you, I want you to lock in. But you, one of your, one of your. Fading in and out is one of the strengths of a good drummer. You <laughs> want to be able to fade in and fade out. No, man. Right. 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 Now, when, but, I mean, you're not, you're not, you're not playing the kit right now. You're, you're talking to Jake Feinberg on the, on the Jake Feinberg show. It's. I want you to talk. If you've ever tried it, you know how hard it is to <laughs> fade out a song? Nobody does it except Bruce and the E Street Band. We actually fade out songs. You, well, I mean, but it speaks to dynamics. And that, and, and even though you were a law student, I, I, I have to believe, because, this is what George Porter from the Meters told me. He said, and I, just, and I want you to talk about it because I know you were, had your drums in your car uh, in North Jersey. He said, he said to me, there was a period of the old recordings, and this is kind of what you were talking about, where bass drums were not prevalent in the music. It was mostly the top end of the drum kit. It wasn't until the 70s when the bass drums got into the mix or when they started remastering some of those old sessions, the drum kit got to be a little bit fuller. As a kid, I remember hearing the top end of the drums more than I heard the bottom end. I think I got the idea to be closely related to the kick drum and leaving the snare drum alone through my session work with Alan Toussaint. It was a strict rule, you don't put a note where the snare drum is. In the jazz community, the backbeat wasn't that necessary in the music because the snare drums were playing kind of free kind of things on top of secondary melodies on top of the swing thing. 
Were you ever like in even in a ba- I mean, because you were near the Key Club, you were near all the Rudy Van Gelder. There was some gr- hot jazz clubs. Did you ever play or make a conscious effort? This is prior to joining Bruce, where you were just playing time, really focusing on the top of the kit, playing time on the cymbals, like you talked about with Max Roach, and using the bass drum more for rebound. No, never. Never. Uh, that wasn't my style or orientation at all. No, uh, I am a rock drummer. And uh, the reason you didn't hear the bass drum on a lot of records was not because the drummer wasn't playing it, but when you make an album, a long playing album, in those days, you could only get a maximum of 20 minutes or 22 minutes a side. That's right. And when they talk about being in the groove, they're literally grooves in a vinyl record, as people know who in vinyl is coming back. So what you sacrifice to get more music on that is bottom end, bass, dr- certainly bass drum. So while the drummers uh, would be playing uh, the bass drum, uh, in a, a, particularly in a, you know, in a pop song, let's say, pop, rock, uh, something other than what the people generally think of as jazz, uh, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't make the record, even though they were playing it. There's a great rock song that I'd like to point out to your listeners, drummed on by the great jazz drummer, Panama Francis. Wow. Now, Panama Francis was, and I knew him when he was in his 80s, and he was the busiest session player in New York in the 50s. He played on all of the great Atlantic R&B records. And Tom Dowd, who was the engineer uh, and later the big producer, famous producer, uh, from Atlantic Records was the first engineer to be able to ca- capture the clarity of everybody playing in the studio. In any case, Panama drums on a song by Dion, Dion DiMucci, hmm. the great uh, uh, doo-wop singer and uh, great writer and great just all-around singer, but he plays on the song called The Wanderer. And if you listen to the drum part, because Panama was younger than Kenny Clark. If you listen to the drum part, he's playing a bebop drum part. He's leaving the bass drum out, and he's only on a rock record, on one of the greatest rock records ever recorded, The Wanderer, and, it's, and he's doing everything on the snare drum. And then he's playing the hi-hat on the upbeats. Hmm. So it's... And he's doing... So he's playing... If you listen to the drums on The Wanderer, that is his bebop as anything I've ever heard. It took tremendous coordination to be able to play an upbeat eighth note with the hi-hat cymbals and just these accents with the bass drum while keeping the time on the snare drum. And it's a bebop approach to making a rock record. There's a lot of examples of that. And uh, Gary Chester was, in the 60s, the go-to guy for uh, records in New York. Um, he went in the 1954 or five, maybe even a little earlier, he was from Brooklyn and he won, he won the Gene Krupa drum contest. So he wanted to be a jazz drummer and, you know, jazz took a, uh, economically took a big hit in the fifties. Big bands were exorbitantly expensive to maintain and Gary got busy in the studio. But if you listen to the rock records he made, He's playing like a jazz drummer. He's mm-hmm. throwing in little triplet things, little bass drum things that the you know typical rock drummer would not would not ever think to play. Which is why that age of rock and roll drums uh, and rock and roll records, which were being played and recorded by jazz musicians, that's why that music is held up so well. Because you're, you know, these guys were, you know, they were uh, moonlighting as, as session guys and making their money playing sessions. And then they go to the clubs at night and play till three in the morning. And they all did it. And they, if you look at the credits on rock records, they were all jazz drummers. Earl Palmer, who played on all of the New Orleans, well, most of the New Orleans stuff, uh, you know, when Alan Toussaint. Oh, was, all of you that know, stuff. Well, he, listen, uh, when I interviewed. I wanted, way before Alan Toussaint. But I was going to say. Way before Alan Toussaint. Way before Alan. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. So Palmer. Oh, that's oh, right. 1940s. Earl Palmer was playing 
in New Orleans on uh, Fats Domino's records, 1949, The Fat Man. And then he became extremely successful in New Orleans, but he moved to Los Angeles. And all the sort of 60s and 70s funk records that Alan made, who was also uh, someone I knew a bit and just the ultimate gentleman, ultimate gentleman. And of course, you know, everyone who knows that what a phenomenal talent he was. Um, they had a variety of drummers come in after Earl Palmer, but Earl Palmer, if you listen to the great Little Richard records, that's a jazz drummer playing it. Listen to the little, the little snare drum trills he does and the way he doubles the bass drum. I had the pleasure of, when I had the TV band, having my favorite drummers. One of the bits in the show was I'd have my favorite drummers come on and play with my band. So I had Tony Williams. I had Earl Palmer. I had Joe Morello. I had Louis Belson come on to the show and play. That's and great. see Ugh. Earl Palmer, you know, I was sort of off camera, but behind him, to watch him play my drums, it was like watching uh, <laughs> a 1950s recording session with, you know, Little Richard. And he, you know, he and Steve Gadd had something in common other than great drumming. They were both, they were both, and Buddy Rich as well, they were all tap dancers. You know, Steve Gadd was a tap dancer. And when you look at these guys play and you listen to some of the things they played, we're talking about the bass drum, you can see the dancing in their playing for sure. And Buddy, of course, was a you know major vaudeville star as a, as a kid. Traps the boy wonder, um, and he didn't start playing the drums, Buddy Rich, until he was 18 years old. I mean, as a serious drummer. And by the time he was 21, he was he was the best drummer around. Talking to Max Weinberg here on the Jake Feinberg Show, fading in it. Now you sound fantastic. I I got another audio clip that's going to bring a smile to your face. Uh, this is a. Uh, uh, one of your one of the guys that you learn jazz well take a listen to it and then we'll uh we'll come back think of this i'll go back several years and think of this i'm i'm 18 years old i'm studying with joe morello it was about a five-hour car drive from where i live on long island to get to the new jersey music store where joe was teaching five hours one way i'd get there and take a one-hour lesson with with joe and he would just absolutely you know be be flawless in his teaching and in his playing and in his demonstration and where he took you with each lesson, after that one hour, I would then drive five hours home. So when I would ask Joe, Joe, can I take a two-hour or a three-hour lesson? Joe would say, no, you can only take one hour. I said, well, Joe, I'll actually pay you more money for the three hours than you would make for three hours. I just want to have that kind of time. He said, no, when you come in and you know you have one hour, you've got to really pay attention and get the most out of that hour. Mm. So now I'm driving 10 hours for a one-hour lesson in one day. So the first thing is you got to realize that just that effort of what it took because <laughs> I, I was seeking, it was insane, and I was seeking knowledge from a person that I knew he had what I wanted. So the the trip was unimportant. So now I studied with Joe for about eight years, eight years, and we never touched the drum set once. I love it. I eight it years lo I on a I on it. a practice pad, Jake. Where he just. You have any idea who that is? No, I don't. Dom Fumilaro. Oh, Dom. Okay, so what Dom a is a dear... I, what I was, a clinician. Well, I was just up at the Art of the Rhythm section in Mesa with Billy Cobham and uh, Dom, and we did a Facebook Live interview, and uh, Dom has become a dear comrade. I visited him in Port Jeff, but here it is. This cat's going from Port Jeff or wherever he was in the, on the island, driving to Morello to the, pra to the studio in Morello's. He never got on the trap set. Max, and I'm like reading this this little bit of bio, and you're like, and I'm like, boy, you know, you had a chance to study with Morello, and he helped you over play with tendinitis, and I just I wanted you to take us through that how he this cat was a minimalist, I mean Dom Fumilaro driving five hours one way, and he only played on the pad. I mean that's insane. Well, Joe lived in Irvington, New Jersey, which was uh, the town next to where I grew up. And uh, during the, uh, my 30s, which was in the uh, early 80s, um, I developed a really bad problem with tendonitis. A lot of drummers get it, uh, overuse syndrome. And I really needed to uh, refine my technique. So Joe, Joe became, for me, kind of a drum guru. And he took me... It was almost like psychotherapy for the drums. He took me back 
to being a kid and you know very often a, a, i can make an analogy a, a batter baseball will be sent down to the minors to work on his swing and his mm, hitting right this is what it was like he completely took apart the way i was playing holding the sticks my strokes because he was extraordinarily technical and um and showed me how to play with maximum velocity, maximum volume or minimum volume with complete relaxation. So, for example, Jake, and I hope you're around on Thursday when I play at the Fox Theater in Tucson mm -hmm. with this Max Weinberg's jukebox. If you, I play for about two hours, and with Bruce Springsteen, we play sometimes four hours. People ask me how I do that. I do it because of what Joe Morello taught me in terms of playing with utter relaxation. And that's really hard to do. And it took me a long time, several years, to really get that down. He could also do, he would blow your mind by, you know, you would do, he, he, the first day I, lesson I took, he, uh, and it was, and, and Don was correct, it was, it was never on a drum set. It was always on a drum pad. <laughs> he was always playing on a drum pad. Right. He told stories about being on the road on the State Department tours in the 50s, and he'd, always, he'd be out by the pool in Morocco, you know, playing on a, with a pair of drumsticks, playing on a, a lounge chair. He was always playing and uh, working on his, but never on a drum set, because you don't need to practice on a drum set. It's all, it, you know, it's, it's in your head. It's all in your head. And I shouldn't say you don't need to practice on a drum set. If you play on a drum set, and if it's in your head, you should be able to play it. That's one of the things that Joe taught me. Um, it's also one of the things that Buddy Rich, I can't say I ever took a lesson, but I did have private time with him on his drums at several of the shows that, of course, I followed around like a, uh, the fanatic Buddy Rich fan that I was. Uh, and he, he took a liking to me. But getting back to Joe, Joe would do this thing where he'd ask you to play a single stroke role as fast as you could. And, you know, usually when rock drummers particularly do that, they'll tense up. So I'm playing as fast as I could. He was able to slip in with his right hand or his left hand an additional note to make it a triplet. That's how fast he was. That's how subtle his technique was. He could hit a rim shot from three quarters of an inch off the snare drum that would take your head off. <laughs> and it was all in the way he moved his shoulder his elbow, his wrist, and his fingers. And it was all derivative of the Mahler method, which was something also that Jim Chapin, four -way uh, coordination. the great educator. Four-way four coordination, yeah, that's huge. Well, that was his book. Uh, and, you know, the Jim Chapin, it was, it, the, the Jim Chapin's book was the hardest book to ever, for any drummer to get through. And I don't think you'll find a drummer anywhere who didn't, uh, you know, uh, from Terry Bozio to to uh, the greatest drummers, uh, greatest drummers out there who didn't go through that book and really struggle. It was really hard. But Jim's technique was derived from the Mahler method of like a whip action with your hands and with well, with your whole arm, your arm and your hands and your elbow. And and if, and you look at these all the great drummers. Like for example, Art Blakey did not have the greatest technique. Uh, a lot of these drummers, Philly Joe Jones, did not have the greatest technique. When you compare them to the great technicians, who are also wonderful musicians, um, they got their music across because of the soul that they played with and the passion and the fire and the dynamism. Um, but, you know, there were some great drummers who can't do a drum roll. So it's not about technique. The technique is simply there to make it, to give the drummer more facility as Joe explained it to me, you know, it, it, it really has to do with, you know, the limits of how you express your musicality. In my own case, I am a rock drummer. Now on TV, I played a jazz drummer. That was my role. I'm not a jazz drummer. And I've taken a big band on the road playing the best, the greatest hits of Count Basie and some of uh, the music that I enjoyed. Uh, so when I'm in that role, I think of myself as a, uh, uh, you know, as a big band jazz drummer, but I'm not. I'm a rock drummer, and that's the music that I grew up with and I feel most passionate about. And when you're playing in the E Street Band, 
you know, one thing that may come as a surprise to some people is that we never really, like the, the bass player Gary Callen and I, we never talk about what we're going to do. We're locking in together. There's no such concept. We just play. I love it. We, we've never had a conversation about, well, I'll do this and you do that. And uh, it just falls naturally. And it could be the 43 years we've been playing together. But it, it, uh, in, the, in that band, we all play with Bruce. So instead of it being kind of like a forest of trees, we're like a flying wedge. And, and that's a, I came up as a show band rock drummer who could play a little jazz. I could play a little Latin, but my first love was basically playing a big beat. And I've taken stuff from every drummer I've ever seen or listened to. And there have been periods where, you know, I mean, I was a Cobham fanatic in the early seventies. Uh, I saw Ma Vishnu many times. I saw Nardo Michael Walden's, one of his first concerts when he uh, took over the drum throne for a uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. Incredible. Return to Forever, Herbie, Han Herbie Hancock's Headhunters. I saw all those bands in New York in the 70s. And, you know, I learned from, from everybody I ever, I stole from everybody I ever saw. And it was always very interesting to, uh, to see how they would play whatever they were playing. My son, who is a very well-known, very uh, renowned drummer, Jay Weinberg, he plays with the metal band Slipknot, who, by the way, just won the... He, last year, he won the uh, Modern Drummer Critics Award for Best Metal Drummer. This year, he won the Reader's Award for me Best Metal Drummer. I, he started playing drums when he was 15. He's 27 now. So that's a, that's a lot of accomplishment in 12 years. But I took him to see Roy Haynes. Uh, when he was 12 years old. I took him to see, three years ago, we went to see, at the Blue Note in New York, we went to see Billy Cobham, which was like a time warp, because Billy Cobham plays exactly the way he did in 1973. It was fantastic, you know, and, you, and he drew the connection between Billy Cobham and Terry Bozio and Vinnie Caliuta, um, who, you know, not so much Vinnie, but, you know, uh, a lot of the drummers who came out of the Billy Cobham fanaticism that all drummers, I guess I was, you know, 20, 22 years old at the time, you know, Billy was, he was the man, you know, and everybody wanted to play like uh, him. And uh, a lot of people did. Um, but uh, as I said, you know, I'm someone who can look at any drummer, jazz, classical, and, and learn something from it, from the way the guy holds his, you know, holds his sticks to the way he executes a role, to the way he sits in his posture, uh, all of that is very important. The ergonomics of drumming, you know, to, to be able to play for an hour is tough. You know, and you see Roy Haynes playing for an hour and a half at the age of 90. And, you know, that's not about brute strength. That's about, you know, 70 years of, of, of plying your trade, your craft. Um, you know, Max, you are the latest rhythmist to join the Jake Feinberg show. Over the last six years, I've I've interviewed a thousand a thousand primary source interviews with a lot of musicians. Two interviews with Gad, three interviews with Garibaldi. Uh, I've interviewed Nardo, Michael Walden, Billy Cobb. So, what I'm trying to here's the the question for you is this, and and you can relate it to your son. A lot of cats. Um. Mike Clark, the drummer for the Headhunters, uh, he was on the road with Delbert McClinton, all right, in the 60s. Uh, Tootie Heath, who we heard from earlier, he was not a bebop drummer at first. He was playing R&B. The point is that these cats, all of them, Michael Shreve from Santana, who I'm going to see next week, they all played R&B and blues. They, they had a deep bag of rudiments, okay? So they knew, basically, they were jazz cats, who were either playing rock, funk, or they were playing soul music, but they, they were rooted. They had the vocabulary. They went back far enough. In today's time, what I see with my generation as a Gen Xer and millennials, I see cats that come out as funk drummers, and then they're trying to play jazz. But you can't do that because they haven't gone back far enough in the lineage of the rhythms. Whereas these cats 
all came up. I don't care if whoever, Densmore, I've done three interviews with Keltner. Keltner wanted to be Philly Joe Jones. I mean, all these guys mm-hmm. were jazzers, okay? And then at some point they said, well, kind of like Panama Francis, I don't want to be a starving genius. I'm going into the studio. And they swung all those rock albums. So I'd like you to talk a little bit to the younger peeps listening worldwide. And eventually when this is, when I transcribe these excerpts, about going back deep enough in the lineage of music and how important that is and whether you think younger cats are going back far enough because some people will say, oh, yeah, I know I, I, listen, I know what a shuffle is. I listen to Toto. Or I know what, I know what Boogaloo is. I listen to the Acid Jazz Rebirth in the, in the 1990s. But that's not going back far enough. What, what do you say? I think it depends on the individual if they have an interest. And if they don't have an interest, there's no way they're ever going to learn anything from it. And, of course, there's history. <laughs> you know, going back to the invention, remember, it took two people to play the bass drum and the snare drum until William F. Ludwig Sr., the original William F. Ludwig, invented the drum, the bass drum pedal. So now somebody could sit down and p- play the drums. Because before that, it was all marching band music. So, and we're talking, that's 140 years ago. And that revolutionized drumming per se uh so yeah if you have an interest in that but what i've noticed is you know they is everything is generational and it and a drummer it certainly helps open your ears if you listen to everything you can get your hands on but that's simply not going to happen with a lot of people um there are fewer and fewer and fewer places to play right there are fewer and fewer and fewer opportunities to make a living as a musician, particularly as a drummer. Right. And that has a lot to do with it, uh, where today, like everything else, technology moves so fast, like the webcast we're talking on right now. It moves so fast. Who has the time to go back and really study? Who, what, what young person has the time? Well, it'd be nice if they made the time, but it's go, 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 go. It was like that in the 60s as compared to the 40s. So the conversation hasn't changed at all. And, um, you know, I think you get into trouble as a musician when you define yourself. uh, If I was just a rock drummer, uh, that's my first love. I would have never been the band leader on a major network show for 17 years because rock drumming was too limited. I had to do a little of this and a little of that. And had I not my, in my own case. So I do think what you're saying is apropos of any generation, definitely there is history to your instrument and it's not going to hurt you to listen to something. And, uh, and I'll give you a couple examples of that, but you know, when I played, I backed Tony Bennett on TV, a number of times and he generally never appeared without his trio or his quartet or quintet, but he liked my band and he felt comfortable enough to lead, you know, to vocalize with our band. And that was a big stretch for me to play with Tony Bennett. Mm -hmm. I was nervous. Sure. We did it. It was, and it was swinging and he loved it. And so, you know, you do what's needed. And if you don't have the vocabulary, if you're if you're a drummer and, and I've seen this, I've seen drummers play a dotted 16th and 8th note as ding, 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 ding. There's no triplet in it. Dotted 8th and 16th. There's no triplet in it. Jazz drumming is based essentially, as Buddy Rich said, on single strokes, double strokes, and triplets. You know, how they define jazz, however you define jazz. And, you know, it's a pretty broad spectrum these days. So is rock and pop and everything else there's 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 you know one of the things that's missing in music that has contributed to this cross pollinization is the lack of regionalism in music absolutely i've covered yeah, it the internet had a, had a full interconnection well, that's, yeah. that's just what that's just what's going to happen uh you know if if you have a global reach through the internet i mean it happened a long time before the internet that the lack of regionalism you know particularly in, in my genre that I uh, favor uh, pop and rock music, you know, you have the Memphis sound, you have the Detroit, Chicago, uh, you know, Texas, 
New York, of course, L.A., Northwest. You had all these different pockets of how people interpreted rock and roll. Same thing with jazz. That's largely gone. It's all, it's all just a big melting pot of worldwide influence. Um, and I think that's a good thing in some respects. And in another, you know, I may be nostalgic for a time that doesn't exist anymore. But, you know, one of the things that, that always kind of I questioned was when Buddy Rich started playing funk a little bit, you know, because he had a lot of young guys in the band. And, uh, and and then young arrangers writing in the seventies, you know, kind of the funk thing. You know, he did his own thing with it, but there was no more, no, nobody more brilliant than Buddy Rich at playing what he loved to play. You could tell when he was playing a backbeat that was not something he really enjoyed. Hmm. And uh, you know, he did a lot, made a lot of records in that in that vein to be more current. And he was and he was smart because. You know, it attracted younger musicians, but that was not his thing. And um, when I got on TV, uh, I had never, I'll be honest with you, when I got on TV, I had never played jazz. But I needed to develop a persona, and rock drumming on television <laughs> is a little boring visually. <laughs> Hold on, you can't be, but you, hold on. I just want to be clear for the audience. Max Weinberg, you, your pocket, your, your bag is rock pop, but you're a jazz lover. Yeah. You're a, you, you, maybe you don't think you have great chops or you have great feel. I mean, you have great feel. That's what it's about with jazz. You, and, and so you were a fan of jazz. You just don't consider yourself like. Oh, no, no I was a fan. But Absolutely. I mean, so, so, I mean, you had to transform. How did, how did you make that transformation from to make yourself a little bit more scintillating from just a rock drummer into more of a melodic drummer. Well, I realized, and I was 40 years old, so I realized a number of things. I'd been in the music business for, you know, professionally for probably 30 years at that point. And I realized that rock drumming on television is not very exciting to look at, playing a backbeat. And it wasn't any genius on my part, but what I wanted to do was to hearken back to the time when I used to sit in my best friend's uh, father's den watching Johnny Carson and Ed Shaughnessy playing with that incredible big band. And nobody had done that. You know, Paul Schaefer in 82 brought rock and roll to late night. And that was a fantastic thing. I didn't want to do that. I'd spent all my career up to that point playing with Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. I wanted to do something different. And the only direction that NBC gave me personally was no funk. A little later we expanded it, but initially it was no funk, no rock, <laughs> no jazz. <laughs> what are you supposed to play? No, so, no, well, what, so they eliminated a lot of genres that were being played on TV. At Brantford, Brantford Marcellus on The Tonight Show, you know, who's an authentic, you know, who's just an, an amazing jazz musician who can play anything. Sure. You had the Arsenio Hall show, uh, which was basically a funk band, jazz funk, but heavy on the funk. G.E. Smith leading the, 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 the uh, SNL band, Saturday Night Live, was a blues band, basically. And you had Paul Schaefer playing, at that time, you know, more oldies and, you know, rock. So they, so you can do anything you want, but don't do those four things. So what I latched on to was Jump Blues, which was the transitional music post-war between jazz and rock and what became rock and roll, where in Earl Palmer's uh, words, they started playing a strong afterbeat. We call it a backbeat, mm. where instead of just playing time on the cymbal, now you started hitting the two and the four, and that turned into rock. So nobody was playing that kind of music. It was a great uh, vocabulary of Jump Blues, Probably the most well-known uh, exponent was uh, uh, Louis Jordan and his Timpani Five. Uh, he had a lot of hits. Um, so we started playing jump blues. And jump blues is basically swing with a strong backbeat. And uh, in that, you know, you've got Sil Johnson, who was an incredible sax player. And, uh, I mean, I could go on and on with the names of people most people never heard of because it was a kind of a short-lived genre that was resurrected uh, in uh, a Broadway show in the uh, 80s, uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And then uh, we kind of 
brought that to TV. And it, was, it wasn't jazz, but it wasn't rock. So it fit what the mandate was for me as a band leader and music director. So in that band, I had fantastic players. And the piano player, Scott Healy, serious, serious jazz musician. And, you know, about six months in, he said, gee, if, you know, you got a good feel for this, uh, you know, sort of triplety swinging kind of thing. And we swung everything. We'd play a Beatles song and we swung it. We didn't play it rock. That was absolutely. my mandate to absolutely. myself. Absolutely. absolutely. I'm not going to play any rock. And it became a hook. I always had good technique. I always had good chops. Um, look at my son for chops. I mean, I've never seen anybody play the drums the way he plays drums. He's just unbelievable with, you know, his heavy metal chops. And he can also play punk and he can play rhythm and blues. But on TV, Scott Healy said to me about six months in, you know, you like, you're good at this. You like this. Here's a count. Why don't you listen to Count Basie? Now, I'd never listened to a Count Basie record. This is back in 93. So he gave me Atomic Basie. And I said, yeah, there's a couple of tunes here I could probably play. So it took me years to get the confidence to actually go out and start a big band, a 15-piece band where, you know, I could do a drum solo and I can... Because I was never a soloist. I was never interested in soloing. I worked. I always was interested in working. And that meant no drum solos. That means you're an accompanist. That's how I got in the E Street Band. So, but, you know, the guys in the band would start to... Here, listen to this. You know, uh, here's uh, Thelonious Monk. So I'd heard the name, but I'd never listened to anything by Thelonious Monk. This was, you know, I was 40 years old. Here's Thelonious Monk. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like that song, Well, You Needn't. Let's play that. Who, who, was, who, was hipping you, base, who was hipping you to the... Hold on, you know, by the way... The guys in the band. For, I mean, but, but just for the record, uh, Max claims he, he doesn't keep time on the cymbals, but I want you to listen to this piece. This is from the E Street Band. And I want you to listen to your drumming, and then we can come back and break down what you're doing as far as keeping time. Music on the Jake Feinberg Show brought to you by the Jewish Community Center of Southern Arizona, the Jewish Federation of Southern Arizona, Craig Pretzinger of Allstate Insurance, Abbott Taylor Jewelers, and our Zach Wagner Jewelers. And we can't thank him for their support enough so we can play clips like that for Max Weinberg. Now, there was a, there was a brief clip in there, the transition between the B3 and the piano. All I heard was you dancing on that top of the kit. 
you correct me. You t- you take it away from there. But I, I heard Max Weinberg keeping time on the symbols. Uh, well, as I said, I uh, I could play a little bit of everything. <laughs> uh, and, uh, that was Kitty's back. That's right. Nineteen seventy-five. The, the bombs. That was the bomb scare show. Seventy-five. Milwaukee. Oh, Milwaukee. So amazing because. I was look. I played that. I went to, uh, which is interesting because your dad had two summer camps in the Poconos. I went to uh, for fourteen summers. Went to a Jewish summer camp in upstate New York called Scatico, and I, we used to play. But when we were going out for you know third, fourth, fifth activity before we leave in the bunk, I had a burned CD of this bomb scare show, and I was always like, "Yo, this part gets so jazzy." I mean, it just gets right in that. Like Bruce goes off on his vocal riffs. And then what you were talking about with talent earlier, there was no discussion. You guys were talking melodically. I mean, it was the most, it was. Yeah. And so I'm like, dude, Weinberg was keeping time on the cymbals. And we heard it just now. And we heard it worldwide. Well, you know, Jake, if you listen to that, and then you look, think back to the ad that Bruce and the E Street Band put in the Village Voice in 1975, looking for a drummer, it said, in parenthesis, you know, drummer wanted, it said no junior ginger bakers, <laughs> which was actually yeah. indicating to me they wanted an accompanist. But it also say, it said jazz to R&B. So I had a familiarity with, you know, I mean, that was basically a shuffle, but, you know, you're throwing in a little bebop accent with the bass drum here and there. Um, and we still do that song. And I still throw those accents in. And, I think one of the things that people don't realize about Bruce, because he never really shows it, is I mean, he can play all that West Montgomery chordal stuff. Really? Like nobody's business. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, Whoa. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he is a, uh, you know, he's never really exhibited that uh, uh, during a show, whether it's a solo show or a, one of our shows. Uh, but, yeah, he can play all that crazy stuff. But we used to have a rule in the uh, 70s and 80s, no seventh chords. So everything was just one, four, five, basically. Don't throw the seventh in there. Midnight Hour, the song, has no seventh chord in it. And that sem- somehow relaxed in the last uh, 15 years or so. But um, so very, you know, very strict uh, criteria and vocabulary for the kind of rock and roll we played. But, you know, the ad said jazz to R&B. And that's basically what I did. If you needed a soul beat, I played that. If you needed a little, you know, Dixieland beat or a Broadway two beat, that's what the drummers that I admired knew how to do. You know, a guy like any of the drummers we've been talking about, any of the great jazz drummers, knew how to play a show. They knew whether or not they became an Elvin Jones or a Buddy Rich or, uh, you know, an Art Blakey. They knew how to cut a show for someone else. Uh, a lot of people came up out of the Cab Calloway band in the uh, in the 30s. And, you know, you had to know how to play a show. You couldn't just be uh, completely esoteric. And they studied and they learned. I mean, Max Roach went to Juilliard to get a doctorate uh, degree, you know. And uh, he, Max Roach, well, you say, you know, in the world of music, you say Max. You're not thinking of Max Weinberg. You're thinking of Max Roach. <laughs> no, I mean, Max I'm thinking Roach of Ma- was... I'm thinking of both. Both, man. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> but Max Roach was the cool. He was the Steve McQueen of jazz drummers. He was the cool. Now the Miles Davis of jazz drummers. The coolest guy out there. You know, cool when he played. Cool when he talked. His whole thing was just something to emulate. And uh, you know, so I'm a my whole thing is you know, I've got a little bebop band that I play with and we basically play hard bop um, you know hard silver art Blakey stuff that is just on it's it's muscular enough to almost be in some cases rock and roll you know uh, uh, and great players uh, Dave Kokoski who's the greatest jazz pianist I've ever seen uh, it's a five piece band I've toured Europe with them and we've played the festivals and uh, you know, we'll occasionally do a club date. I've got a guy named Brandon Wright on saxophone. Uh, fantastic uh, uh, players. Uh, Cameron Brown is the bass player. Wow. wow. John Bailey. John Bailey, amazing trumpeter. Uh, it's a five piece band. And, you know, there's video of us playing Night in Tunisia in Italy two summers ago. And it was pretty damn good, <laughs> I must say. 
you know, I mean, these guys are serious jazz musicians and, you know, I'm the leader of the band. So, uh, and, and particularly Dave Kukoski, incredibly encouraging for me to stretch and stretch and stretch. And so if you look at stuff of me on YouTube, you'll find me playing rock and roll, soul music, jazz, so to speak. You know, um, I played in a Broadway show. That's how I left the Broadway show to join the E Street Band in 1974. So as I was saying, all those drummers that I admired growing up, they knew, you know, Sonny Payne with Count Basie, who was just, I mean, look at him play and the tricks he does when he does a drum solo. And this guy was a show band drummer, you know, and just an amazing, amazing drummer in the mid 60s with Count Basie. Uh, Rufus Speedy Jones was his successor in that band. There's a great clip of Count Basie backing up Frank Sinatra on one of Frank Sinatra's TV specials from probably 68 or 69, Rufus Speedy Jones, double bass drum. And uh, that would, that's on YouTube. I would recommend anybody to check that out. He was, now, he's not a name that people, you know, off the top of their tongue, people interested in jazz might know. But, uh, you know, uh, an amazing, an amazing drummer. Uh, you know, the drummers who, uh, Irv Kotler, you know, Irv Kotler, who was a dear friend of mine, who was the the greatest big band drummer for a vocalist out there. What he about Don Lamond? Don Lamond? Years. Don Lamond? Don Lamond, I had the pleasure of talking to Don Lamond not long before he passed. And Don Lamond, Unbelievable. Was East Coast, well, he was, a, he was a, an amazing drummer, of course, a jazz drummer. And he was the drummer, uh, famously, on Bobby Darren's Mac the Knife, where all those sort of offbeat fills <laughs> come in yeah. as, as pickups to an anticipated chord. That's Don Lamont. So, you know, if you listen to that, I mean, he swung, his, uh, he swung like crazy. He swung his know? butt off. No, um, but I, this is, uh, you know. That's I'm, what I was going to say. What I was gonna, this is the thing. You keep bringing up terminology. And I, in my, I have, it's a two-part question. There was no word for funk in the lexicon of music in this in the late '60s. Funk did not come along as a word until maybe um, someone would say, "Let's play a funky blues." Okay, and even so, what my, the two 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 questions are? You keep talking about phenomenal jazz player. I maintain that genres have have really stifled vocabulary in music because before it was all music and and it's played out by the fact when i did two interviews with bill cosby before the world caved in on him only about his involvement in music you could put on any blue note record he could tell you if it was tony williams pete LaRocca, mickey roker max roach you had individual sound okay and those cats played music they didn't play genre music so number one what have genres done to music and the other question for you is this we now have uh, less people going out to see live music because live music has a different significance in our culture. We have less clubs for cats to play in, and they and those clubs don't necessarily even pay those cats. So my question is: Now these cats are going to to academia to learn. Do you believe that the vocabulary of music can grow in academia? So it's genres and well, vocabulary. This is why I am coming to the Fox Theater Beautiful. next Thursday in Tucson because. I believe in live music. Right. And absolutely, academia is important because 20th century music is a century ago. And there are still, and the original purveyors of this music, so many of them are gone, that where else are you going to, if you're interested in it, where else are you going to learn about it? Uh, economically, it doesn't make sense. And, you know, if you asked a bebop drummer who considered himself a bebop drummer in the 40s, if he thought Gene Krupa was a jazz drummer, he would say no. He's not a jazz drummer. Right. He's a swing drummer. So they were self-critical on their own uh, of other forms of what they considered jazz, let's say. Uh, so if you ask Zuddy Singleton what he thought of Gene Krupa, he may not have even known that that was what became known as jazz. I mean, when Zane Krupa uh, with Benny Goodman debuted Sing, Sing, Sing at Carnegie Hall in 1939, uh, that created a riot, a literal riot in the audience. Why? No one had ever why, why heard were, that kind was, of music. People were telling, make him stop, make him stop kind of thing? 
Yeah. Well, it's Carnegie Hall. <laughs> and, you know, he was the king of swing, right. and suddenly you had this unbelievable arrangement, which was written, the song was written by Louis Prima, mm -hmm. the great, you know, became the trumpeter who became the great Las Vegas, with sure. Julie Smith entertainer, sure. uh, the lounge entertainer. And, uh, but he wrote Sing, Sing, Sing. And uh, I don't remember who he played with when he wrote that song, but, uh, you know, they derogatorily uh, reviewed in the New York Times as jungle music. And because of, you know, the Tom Toms and I had the incredible honor to recreate that 39 concert in uh, uh, 99 uh, at the uh, at Carnegie Hall with the New York Pops uh, Orchestra. I played the Gene Krupa part, <laughs> basically, and that was really very exciting for me. Bucky Pizzarelli played guitar on it. Uh, but I can't believe you just named you know, that because so, I was going to say I just list the re I just picked up this Bucky Pizzarelli album with Don Lamond on drums. It's my favorite album now. So yeah, continue. It's unbelievable. It's all cyclical. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the market. You know, the genre. It's marketing. You know, where does it go in the record store? In the jazz section or the R and B section? The soul section? Funk. People always talked about having the funk. Chameleon by Herbie Hancock was in my recollection, the first record I ever heard to is referred to as funk, um, you know, and that record, Sly Stones, you know, uh, Sly Stones records in the 60s Absolutely. were considered funk. Sly Stone was a huge, huge influence on Miles Davis. And, you and know, Herbie, Sly too. Was yeah. a, oh, he absolutely. was a rock and roll yeah. fanatic, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was a rock and roller, and... Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, better that someone studies the history of American music with all the influences from around the world in academia than not at all. You used to be able to go up and down 40 seconds, 50 seconds. I caught the end of the 52nd Street era. I, I do remember being taken uh, as a 16 year old by my sister's. Uh, uh, my, my older sister's boyfriend, who was a jazz fan. And, I knew it. I knew it. You know, I Eddie, knew it. I knew going to Eddie Condon's and, uh, you know, and all the, and there were been 52nd Street. You go there now and it's all office buildings. Then it was all brownstones uh, with jazz clubs in the basement. Exactly. So that doesn't exist anymore. And you still have jazz, you know, uh, particularly around the world. I mean, any major city, there's a lot of jazz what people call jazz, uh, you know, playing the great American jazz songbook. And uh, people still, you know, still making great, let's call them jazz records, Christian McBride, you know, the people you'd expect to be making, you know, great records now in that field are still doing it. You know, Bradford Marsalis, Wynton Marsalis. Um, so it's out there. It's just, it's much more difficult uh, as a traveling musician, I know how difficult it is to uh, operate the uh, clubs and the bars and the venues. Uh, with my big band, I played them all. The theaters and, you know, the Jazz Kitchen in Minneapolis and the Dakota in Minneapolis. Maybe the Jazz Kitchen was in Indianapolis. And, You're right. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely places. Uh, uh, you know, there's a place in Kansas City that was, I mean, a real jazz club, you know. Uh, fitting 15 pieces onto a stage made for a quartet. Well, that's very interesting. But I, I was determined to, to bring big band music, at least for the eight months I did it on the road, to who, whoever could see it. 15 pieces playing the best of Buddy Rich, Count Basie, uh, a couple of arrangements of Springsteen songs done big band style. Wow. And uh, it was really fun. You know, it was a money pit, but it was really fun. And, you know, I learned a lot uh, doing that. And it's something I always wanted to do. Listen, the greatest honor I've ever had by far in terms of being uh, regarded as a musician was seeing my name in the same sentence as Doc Severinsen. There have only been a handful of Tonight Show band leaders, and I'm one of them. And that, for me, seeing my name in the same sentence as Doc Severinsen was a huge, huge thrill. Even though the show, our show only lasted ten months, I still have that. <laughs> hey, and you know, and, that, and your that. and your boy Ed Shaughnessy was was cooking the groove on that with Doc Severinsen. I, the the you know absolutely. Before I let you go, uh, you know, um, 
Can you talk about, here's the bottom line. I don't know if you went to Jim and Andy's on 52nd Street. Kenny Burrell used to go there for a hot meal when they were, you know, A&M Records. Grady Tate was there, all these cats. You know, I mean, these cats were accessible and they were playing live four sets a night, the dawn sessions. Ahmad Jamal started when I interviewed him. He was playing in a drum and uh, he was playing piano and drums at a burlesque house eight hours and they just switch off drums and piano. And the point is it was live. And you just talked about coming, you're coming to Tucson and you know, you're not playing. I don't think, I mean, it's audience requests, but I want you to talk all requests. It's all requests. And I want you to talk, but what you said to me that stuck out, you said, I love the power of live music. And you've been on the bandstand playing raucous R and B rock music with, with the, with the boss for a long time, but explain to the peeps out there who just in general, the visceral feeling, the spiritual, there's only two letters that separate magic and music. And you only really get, you can get that on mm-hmm. records, but you can only really connect that in a live setting. And I kind of wanted you to talk about the, the significance of the live music setting for Max Weinberg. Well, it's immediate. That's why I think people want to become musicians. Generally, uh, whatever the genre, or whatever the sound is, they want to interact. They want to change people's lives. In some cases, in my case, you want to get them dancing. Uh, right. You know, uh, you know, Art Blakey plays Blues March. If you can't dance to that, <laughs> you know, check yourself. You might be dead. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's really the immediate response. Uh, you know, unlike doing some other things, uh, uh, there's nothing like playing in front of a live audience and. Um, and there's not a lot of difference I find uh, when you're making a record you don't play differently I mean maybe you do play a little differently when you're playing live maybe a little bit less for the record uh, in terms of of being a a document Um, but the idea is the same you're using all your abilities to uh, uh, the greatest extent possible along lines of excellence as JFK was fond of remarking. Uh, when you have a live audience, it's your job as a performer to bring it every single time you perform. There are no bad audiences. There's only musicians who showed up and didn't try hard enough. Mm. And <laughs> it's true. They're, 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 the audience wants to love you. That, is that your line? I, I might have to take that line. I like that. I just made it up. Oh, right on. No, I'm, you're an, impro- up, you're an improviser. Oh. But I mean, like, well, like yeah, are you, I mean, are you, are you like, um, what is the main goal? When, I mean, you want to get the audience off and dancing, but like, can you talk about the inspiration you want to leave people with? When after this gig in, at the Real, uh, at the Fox Theater coming up on the on the uh, the twentieth, what what are the the tenets of the uh, of the live music experience that you want to keep the re- that you want it to resonate amongst the peeps that we're losing now because in like a town like Tucson, it's like oh yeah, you can play here, but you got to pay to play. You know, it's 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 a different it's yeah. different now. So what are your what are the tenets? Well, we're gonna. I understand. We're gonna party. This is a party band. This right is a, on. This, I only play generally places that are fairly small where there's usually a bar, and it's a bar <laughs> band. And uh, <laughs> we play requests of my favorite music from the 50s and 60s. And, um, yeah, the whole pay-to-play thing is uh, a little crazy. But, you know, musicians will... Uh, listen, I'd be happy if there's a stadium to play, I'll play it. If there's a club to play, I'll play it. As Frank Sinatra once said, to an interviewer, they're all $50 gigs. And it wasn't a put down. It was, you do your best no matter where you're playing. That's your job. Right. And it's not your job to just show up and play. It's your job to show up and be great. I think one, that's one of the reasons the E Street Band has lasted so long, the Bruce and the E Street Band, because we take that extremely seriously, the idea to have fun and to be You know, anybody can be great on any given night. They talk about any given Sunday with football teams. But to be consistently hitting the mark and raise the bar, that takes real determination, discipline, and effort. 
And the greats that we've been talking about, whether it's Elvin Jones, Buddy Rich, Joe Morello, Sonny Greer, Papa Joe, Philly Joe, any of the drummers that we've talked about that have made a name for themselves did that consistently. You know, you never saw you, you never saw them uh, not bring it all. Right. I mean, and, and, and if and if Elvin Elvin if Elvin Jones got hired for a gig and he only played brushes, he'd do that just as well, and he'd swing. There was no ego. The ego, well, of course. Yeah, the yeah. ego wasn't that. You know, there, there was, and I think that's the other thing with with the E Street Band. Just leave. You know, it's you got to check your ego at the door. I mean, all the best bands are like that. Well, you have to have a healthy ego to go up there and be a show off. I mean, but the music does come first, and depending on it's all it all depends on the individual gig. You know, I I saw I was fortunate to see one of Buddy Rich's last shows at the Blue Note in New York, and he had his band, and it was about a year before he passed, and uh, John Hendricks was there in the audience mm. as a guest, and Buddy asked him if he wanted to come up and sing. And he did. And they broke the big, big band down into just piano, bass, and drums for about a half hour. And br but it was all brushes. And it was the most dynamic <laughs> thing. I've, one of the most dynamic things I've ever seen oh, Buddy Rich do. And you could tell he was really having a good time. You know, I mean, because, you know, everybody expected him to do West Side Story and the big drum solo or, you know, Channel One Suite. And he did all that stuff. He always did all that stuff, and his, you know, his flamboyance and his uh, pyrotechnics on the drums, he never failed to you know, blow your hair back. But when he was playing with John Hendricks with bass, drums, and piano for about a half hour, you could tell that that was something he really, really enjoyed. It was very special. It wasn't you, you could see it wasn't planned. You know, it was just very spontaneous. It was a small club, you know, 100 people. And uh, well, they're playing like Evolution of the Blues or something, you know. I mean, they're the Hendrix tunes he was getting off on, but it was just so, it, he 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 was it was so and, and it was dynamic. I mean, that's the other part that we really need to discuss in part two is just why they're why we've lost dynamics in in lyric. I mean, I've talked to all the great engineers, uh, Val Garay, and, and the list goes on and on. It, you know, you, you listen to vocal singers, vocalists today. There's no dynamics. They start at ten, they stay at ten. And then you have Pro Tools that can fix it. But I just want to say my one request for this for this gig, I'm gonna I want to request a black rock tune. A what? A, uh, the, the 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 band you were in, uh, 1970. Oh, Blackstone. Blackstone. <laughs> I, I, I'm I, the Casey Funk. We we opened with your little mini drum solo from the first two. I don't know if you caught that when we came into the to the interview, but. I'm calling for. I, I need you to break out one of those tunes because, to me, you were you you were getting off on Dino Donnelly, man. I mean that stuff is that's oh, sure. that's that that's so. So I'm I'm not going to be calling out yeah, for Dino and, Yeah. Well, that's very interesting because that record was recorded in 1970. So no one has ever asked me in the ensuing what is that 47 years? Yeah. To to play a Blackstone song. It was my high school band that did a record for Epic Records, and you know we thought we were going to be uh, the next big thing, and we were quickly disabused of that notion. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a great experience. I was nineteen. Dude, uh, it, I mean, I, I have and, uh, I, I just picked up my copy at the local record store for ten bucks, and it is it's the most wow. smoking record. And I'm telling you, this is where my pocket is. It's one reason you decided to go for a law career. Thank God you answered that. That that letter in the in from from Bruce, but I mean, what? go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, ten dollars. Well, originally it was only a dollar ninety nine, so <laughs> at least it's gone up in value. But um, you know, uh, listen, I've been extraordinarily fortunate just to be able to you know be sixty six, enjoy playing music, enjoy meeting people. That's why I'm doing this tour with what I call my jukebox, which is my favorite songs, and it turns out to be the people who like to see me play. It's their favorite songs. Um, I have plans. I have also a 23-piece society orchestra. Steve Van Zandt calls me Desi when I do it. Where I don't <laughs> even play drums. I'm the guy up front in the white dinner jacket. Your ham, ham bone you are. Society music. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's you know, I've got a great salsa uh, component to the group. It's a 23-piece band. 
I don't play very often with them because it's, it's like moving the Queen Mary, but uh, <laughs> I do that. I still do my little bebop band from time to time. And, uh, uh, you know, so to me, there is no genre. It's all, if it's a song, I can figure out a way to play the drums to it. Well, I hope that's my bottom line. We we just um, we just cooked here for eighty minutes. Uh, I I, wow. I I really had a ball with you, and I'm going to send you so you can see what I've been no, we did. doing for six six years. I've been woodshedding for a long time here, and uh, big thanks to Mark Stein for for finally putting this together because I knew we'd have a ball, and uh, I look forward to doing more with you, Max. I, I feel like we're just getting started here. I don't think we talked about the E Street Band barely at all, so we got more to do. Well, Jake, we can definitely do this. We'll do the Feinberg and Weinberg show. The Feinberg and Weinberg sometime. show. You got it. Right. Yeah. Two Jews go into a studio. <laughs> as and, the old uh, and play brushes uh, and play uh, brushes. Goes. <laughs> Two Jews. Hey, but, listen. Yeah. Happy Rosh Hashanah, man. And uh, I look, f- I look forward to seeing you uh, in Tucson with the jukebox and. Uh, you know, just just get get that uh, get that Blackstone stuff ready to go. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm gonna try to do that. Love, 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 and you know, there was some pretty. Uh, all I know is I threw a Billy Cobham roll into every song on that record. <laughs> a long, you know, he, he used to go around the toms. Somewhere in every song, I figured out, you know, I could do that. Um, after I got an Easter band, I realized. Don't do that. Well, I just want to talk anymore. about. I want to talk about next time you and Gary Talent playing off of each other because when you stretch out, it, it's 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 about as jazzy as it, it can get. So much love, Max. Have a well, great day. You. I'll get you a copy of this uh, later on today. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate it. Take care. Hope to see you Thursday. All right, Max. Much love. Take, Take care. care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Another insp- inspiring interview with uh, the great drummer, Max Weinberg. He's a master of all trades. Uh, we'll be back next week with a whole bunch of new guests. Larry Klein and uh, Mon- Monica Gets Part 2. In the meantime, uh, we will see you later.